Hello, this is Mike Endel. I'm going to give an overview of the EPRV instrumentation. So let's begin with some of the basics to consider. Of course, to achieve very, very high radial velocity measurements, the instruments that are currently uh, in operation and are currently being built have to have certain characteristics and some of the uh, important characteristics I want to summarize before we uh, go into the description of the various instruments. So very important is of course the uh, instrument of choice obviously is a high resolution spectrograph and um, before you build your instrument you want to uh, maximize certain things or select where you want to observe. Um, in what wavelength range. So the bandwidth is a very critical parameter for any uh, radio velocity spectrograph since uh, the Doppler information sits in the uh, in the uh, sides of the lines of the of the stellar absorption lines so in the in the wings of the lines. So wherever, wherever the spectral gradient is, is maximum the Doppler information is also uh, uh, optimized. So the broader your uh, bandwidth is, the more Doppler information you can capture in one single spectrum. And then depending on your um, science goals, you want to either observe in the optical, which is typically chosen for sun-like stars, or in the near-infrared, which is typically chosen for M dwarfs. One of the parameters that uh, is also crucial is the resolving power which is to remind, uh, remind everybody what that actually means. That value R is basically the ability of your spectrograph to resolve two monochromatic beams that are separated by a certain wavelength and the full with half max of the uh, separation D lambda is the value that you divide by your current uh, wavelength and you get to, to the uh, parameter R. So the, the larger that number R is, the, the better is the resolving power of your spectrograph. And then, of course, you also need to consider the signal-to-noise ratio. Uh, photon noise will always be a limitation. Uh, so we also want to put our instruments uh, to make them very efficient and to put them uh, onto the biggest telescopes that we have available. Uh, when you have an, uh, uh, when you build an instrument, then you have to consider uh, for extreme radio velocity precision several things. You have to make your spectrograph as stable as possible in order to to reduce instrument effects that uh, show up a systematic noise in your data. So everybody building these instruments nowadays will go for a maximum optomechanical stability of your optical bench and your optical components. So no moving parts, no parts that have, you know, very uh, large thermal expansion factors and things like this. In addition, you also want to put your spectrograph into a highly controlled environment, which is, for instance, usually done nowadays by putting this. Uh, instruments into a vacuum tank so that not even the, the atmosphere inside the, the spectrograph is changing. You also need a very highly efficient and very stable detector. Just to remind us what we are talking about, a Doppler shift of 10 centimeters a second corresponds typically to just a small shift of one nanometer on the, on the detector. So once you have basically your hardware stabilized, you also want to stabilize the illumination of your uh, instrument. This illumination will provide uh, some uh, point spread function stability. So this was something, for instance, that we, we never had at the beginning of the radio velocity uh, field when we were using standard multi-mode high resolution spectrographs and we needed to uh, keep track of the changes of the PSF by for instance using an, an iodine uh, absorption cell. But you can um, stabilize your illumination and therefore your point spread function for instance by using optical fibers of various um, shapes for instance octagonal fibers or, or rectangular fibers 
that scramble the light very nicely. And on the right hand side, you have here a very nice example of, uh, of fiber scrambling. We also need to reduce or minimize the, the modal noise of a fiber, which is typically done by agitating the, the fiber in some, some way. So once we are done with stabilizing uh, the instrument and the illumination pattern, in order to minimize our instrumental noise, we are left over with uh, getting a very good wavelength calibration for our spectra, which is of course a crucial component. Uh, this has been done typically with uh, a reference lamp in a stable spectrograph, like for instance a standard 4M argon lamp. Uh, but nowadays we also use uh, laser combs, laser frequency combs, which are uh, quite an expensive solution. And very popular and more and more popular are Fabry Perot etalons that provide a, a, a stable wavelength reference. Here's a list of current EPRB instruments and future EPRB spectrographs. Uh, I want to immediately say that this is an incomplete list. I probably forgot or left over some of uh, current instruments or near future instruments, so apologies to everyone who didn't, doesn't, don't see their uh, instruments right here. And uh, the highlighted, and what do I regard uh, actually as an EPRB instrument? I regard in, uh, in this presentation, I just make basically the decision to um, call an EPRV instrument uh, a spectrograph uh, when it was built and designed for the purpose of optimizing and maximizing the radio velocity precision and to achieve a radio velocity precision in, of the ballpark of around one meters a second or better. So you will see here, for instance, that high res at CAC, which was, of course, an incredibly productive radio velocity spectrograph, uh, is left out here because high res was not intended immediately to provide this uh, high radio velocity precision. It's a multi-mode instrument. And the same is true also for any McDonald Observatory high resolution spectrograph that is, that is using the, the iodine cell that were never designed for, for one meter a second precision. But except for HBF, the habitable zone planet finder at the, at the HET. The highlighted uh, instruments here, HARPS, Espresso, Carmen, is, uh, HBF and NUIT, I will uh, show in more detail to highlight kind of the various different architectures and solutions and types of EPRV instruments. So let's start with HARPS, because HARPS is arguably the first EPRV instrument built by Geneva uh, Observatory for ESO. So it's at the ESO 3.6 meter telescope. It's also the oldest instrument of this type. It's in operation since 2003. You can see here on the left hand side the optical bench, highly stabilized. Uh, inside the vacuum tank, tank and the, uh, the, teles uh, the instrument is connected to the telescope via uh, an optical fiber. And it's using as a calibration source a 4M argon holo cathode lay, uh, lamp. And this is uh, simultaneously imaged onto the detector. And it provides a pretty, uh, really, really high long-term precision as shown at the bottom uh, right, where you see the plot of the HARPS radio velocities of the nearby bright G-type star Tau Ceti, with a long-term precision over 10 years of about one meter uh, a second. This instrument uh, is, was so successful that, uh, not surprisingly, a clone was built for the Northern Hemisphere at the Telescopio Nacional Galileo of, on La Palma. And in future, there will be a third instrument, HARPS-3, at the Isaac Newton Telescope, uh, uh, as well as uh, on La Palma. At ESO, there is also currently one of the premier EPRV instruments uh, built again by uh, Geneva uh, Observatory. It's basically a continuation of the, of the HARPS line for the ESO VLT. 
The ESOVOT has four unit telescopes and one of the distinctions of this um, teles uh, of this instrument is that the, the light is fed from the telescope to the instrument via a, a standard uh, coup day train. So once the, the light enters the com combined coup day lab where the instrument is located, uh, that light, the starlight is then fed into a fiber, into an entrance fiber that goes into the instrument. There are two large arms, uh, a blue arm and a red arm uh, in the optical um, architecture of Espresso. There's one uh, large uh, a shell grating and a dichroic that splits the two um, uh, arms, uh, a blue arm and a, uh, a red arm. Here is the, the whole instrument is, so both arms of the spectrograph are inside one single vacuum tank and the detectors as you see are, are shown on the top sticking out and more easily accessible. And here are the, the data for Espresso, so the blue arm goes from 380 to 520 nanometers, the red arm from 520 to 780 nanometers and there are no gaps in the spectral coverage. Interesting thing about the Espresso is also that um, it is, has three different modes of operation that differ from um, uh, in terms of resolving power. So the, the ultra high resolution mode is uh, at 225,000 where the uh, aperture on the sky corresponds to half an arc second. And then there is the, the, the standard high resolution mode with 134,000 resolving power and one arc second. And then a, a, a medium resolution four UT when you combine all four UTs of about 59,000 um, resolving power, four times one arc second re resolution on the, uh, on the sky. And down at the bottom, you see the expected instrument RV precision of less than 10 centimeters a second for the high resolution modes and about one meter a second for the for the combined four telescope mode. Let's take a look at some results. Short term precision. This is one night of espresso observing um, the star HD 85512. This is a very quiet star and you see the, the, the wonderful um, Data has an RMS scatter of uh, 28 centimeters a second. So this is an absolute uh, high RV precision. And some of the benchmarks in terms of magnitude and exposure times are given uh, at the bottom. Once you go to very short exposures and high, of course, uh, bright magnitudes, you can uh, probably achieve uh, even down to uh, 10 centimeters a second. Now this is the short-term precision, so this was taken over one night. What about the long-term precision? One planet very close to my heart is uh, Proxima b. This was just recently uh, published, uh, showing pro uh, espresso observations of this uh, of Proxima Centauri, uh, clearly revealing the uh, the eleven-day planetary signal. And I want you to focus especially on the on the top right panel. Which is the phase plot of the uh, of the radio velocities from espresso, which give you uh, just an RMS of 27 centimeters a second. All right, the next instrument that I want to talk about is the Carmen spectrograph, which is actually two spectrographs. This is an EPRV instrument that is um, put on the on the Cala Alto 3.6 meter telescope. And it consists of an optical spectrograph that uh, covers everything from 530 nanometers to one micron at a resolving power of nearly 100,000 uh, and a precision of about one meter uh, a second. Again, the spectrograph is of course stabilized inside a vacuum tank uh, using a standard deep depletion CCD detector. The near infrared arm is at a resolving power of 80,000, goes from 950 nanometers to 1.7 microns. It's also in the vacuum tank, it's cooled down to 140 uh, degrees Kelvin. 
and the goal of the radio velocity precision for the near infrared is, is one meters a second. So this instrument is in particular also designed to observe M dwarfs. And here is a, a graphical overview of the two spectrographs connected to the to the telescope. In this case, uh, the calibration unit is actually a Fabry-Perot etalon that uses a, a halogen lamp as the white light source, spreading out the uh, the light into a cone, which in the infrared, um, so both of these, it's two separate uh, fabri perots that are optimized for the visible and for the near infrared and they give the one uh, in the infrared gives uh, about 10,000 emission lines as a reference while the, the visual unit gives you about 18,000 emission lines as a wavelength reference. So here is an actual image of a common spectrum of, uh, from both spectrographs at the bottom is the visible one with 61 orders and the top is the is 28 orders of the near infrared and you see the um the uh in the zoom in you see the stellar spectrum as well as the emission lines from the fabry perot just below it this is a very interesting plot that compares the radio velocity precision provided uh, from uh, Carmen as, as a function of wavelength. So this the absolute numbers here are actually not so interesting because uh, for an M5 star, by the way, that's important, of course, to say. So this is a mid M, M dwarf. And, um, and the RV precision is not extreme because the only uh, a short wavelength range was, the, uh, was used for the uh, for the determination of the radio velocity. But the overall trend is very interesting. So for an M5 star, you see that uh, the, the, the minimum, so the highest RE precision, is actually still achieved in the red part of the visible spectrum. So in, in the area around 800 to, to 1,000, uh, even to maybe 700 nanometers. This is, uh, of course, also a combination of the instrument and the star. So it's not necessarily that every instrument will give this response function. This is another very interesting plot where uh, the Carmen's visible arm is com compared to the performance of HARPS in, for an M-dwarf survey. We see the histogram of the RMS keta of uh, the radio velocities of various M dwarfs. Carmen S performs very, very comparable and divisible to the um, to the results obtained with HARPS. And because we just talked about M dwarfs, the next thing uh, I want to show is the next instrument is the Habitable Zone Planet Finder that is at uh, at the HET at McDonald Observatory. And we have now in operation. Uh, this is a pure near infrared instrument. Uh, it is uh, uh, also in a vacuum tank. It is actually cooled below 180 kelvins and then heated up by um, by uh, copper strap straps to uh, bring it up to operating temperature of 180 kelvin and then stabilized at this temperature at the millikelvin level. It has uh, various optical components that you see on the right hand side. It has a uh, an, an Hawaii 2RG near infrared detector cut off at 1.7 microns and the spectrograph was uh, designed to cover exactly more or less very close to that wavelength range that I was just talking about from 800 to 1300 nanometers where the Doppler content of mid to late, late M dwarfs is, is at a maximum. And the spectral resolution is at 50,000. And we have, um, of course, a stabilized fiber input, optical input for the, for the, for the spectrograph using double scramblers and octagonal fibers. So this instrument was specifically built to provide precision RVs of mid uh, M dwarfs, so M4s and M5s. 
it has the distinction to be the first uh, near infrared spectrograph with an operating laser frequency comb. Here you see in this diagram the um, the simple setup. We have a 30 gigahertz optical frequency comb that translates to a, a, a comb spanning the wavelength range of 700 to 1600 nanometers. And both of these, uh, in this picture here, you see it the, in the B panel, uh, but having both the comb sent through the science fiber as well as through the um, calibration fiber. So you see the two uh, laser combs uh, on top of each other. And doing this, you can of course calculate uh, various different things that are shown on the on the right hand side, which is basically the throughput on panel C, where you see how many counts per uh, come uh, through it in each order. But you can also, of course, calculate the differential drift between those two combs, and which is shown in panel D. Uh, and over four nights, over four test nights. And then at the pan panel E, we see kind of the stability of the combs in centimeters a second compared as a uh, function over, over how long you expose, basically, uh, or the time scale that you, that you are calculating your, your RV stability. And you see the 10 centimeters a second uh, blue line is, is achieved at around uh, um, 60 minutes or so, 80, 70, 80 minutes. So here's an example of HBF, um, HBF observing a, an M star. On the left hand side, you see the, the, the detector image and the zoom in where you see the starlight, um, the order are superimposed or above on the detector of the laser frequency comb. On the right hand side, you see the extracted um, uh, spectrum star on the top, the comb light on, at the bottom to provide the precise wavelength reference. And as an example of the radio velocity performance of HPF, we show here Barnard star, which is known to be a very nice bright uh, M4 reference star. And you see the individual spectra, the light blue data points, which are um, then binned down, which have about 2.8 meters a second scatter and then binned down in the near infrared uh, to provide a near infrared um, uh, precision of about 1.5 meters a second. Okay, the last instrument I want to talk about is uh, called NUID, which is the, the NN Explorer uh, spectrograph, the collaboration between NASA and NSF, that is currently at the WIN telescope. And this is another of these EPRV spectrographs that are supposed to basically give us a, 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 an RV precision of 30 centimeters uh, a second or less. So it's at the 3.6 meter wind telescope as a wavelength coverage, almost the entire optical spectrum, 380 to 930 nanometers, as a uh, resolving power of 120,000. And the, the goal of this project is to provide a single shot radio velocity precision of 30 centimeters a second. Commissioning of the, instru the instrument was built and delivered and commissioning started, but unfortunately the current ongoing pandemic interrupted uh, the, the commissioning process. But uh, it will be, this is an instrument that will be available to the, um, to the community via the NN Explorer um, program. It has two observing modes, which is for the uh, brightest stars, maybe less than uh, 12 um, magnitude, for instance, for test uh, targets, where you have uh, the highest, uh, expect the highest possible precision with the, with the high resolving power of 120,000. And it also has a high efficiency mode with half of the resolving power, with not the maximum radio velocity precision, which is meant for fainter targets, poor weather, and, and other conditions. 
So the optical design and optical layout of Newit is shown here on the, on the right hand side. And this is the spectrum format of, uh, of Newit. So it covers many very important uh, things like for instance also in the blue the calcium H and K lines which are uh, well-known, well-characterized stellar activity traces. They also have H alpha and of course the sodium lines and, and the other lines. This is a very uh, interesting slide from um, Halverson et al. 2016 because it basically uh, summarizes the entire era budget and I, I'm sure there will be more um, there will be more discussion on this uh, during the workshop uh, but, but what is really really interesting to see is that these various different components they all flow into the, the final era budget of the instrument so we have here uh, a target number of about 27, 27 centimeters a second and the various components which come from things like uh, uncalibratable instrument performances like for instance the fiber performance or detector effects as well as other things like the barycentric correction barycentric correction errors will uh, uh, occur and in the middle we have uh, things that can be calibrated instruments so, so thermal uh, optical mechanical stability detector effects like for instance pixel inhomogeneities are, are a factor electronic noise and so on stitching errors where the uh, CCD waivers are stitched together and on the on the right hand side we have um, something about the calibration source and external errors like for instance errors coming simply from the from the from the software algorithms that are, that are used uh, and at the bottom we have here telescope errors and atmospheric errors you see so that you, you can you can see the various different weights that these uh, factors go into the into the error budget so the one of the largest uh, components is actually actually the external uh, errors in the calibration process it's around 18.7 uh, 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 centimeters a second combined with telescope and atmospheric effects of course here's an example of the first light image um, that was obtained in December 2019 so before the, the shutdown through the, the pandemic and you see the entire 380 nanometer to 930 nanometer spectral range of the uh, of the instrument and you have on the right hand side showing the, the order trace from the starlight as well as the, the um, frequency comb calibration reference light. I think Newit will be a very interesting instrument for everybody in the in the field because it is open to the community and you will actually get um, provided from the pipeline from the system in the archive uh, various uh, levels of, of data products so the the level zero is just the, the raw data of course if you want to perform your own uh, reduction while the level one results will be already extracted, reduced uh, spectra that have uh, contain extensions of the of the sky uh, background, the science fibers, the calibration and wavelength so solution, and the the higher level science products will be then radio velocities that contain all these various different uh, components. So I think once commissioning is uh, completed of new it we are all looking forward to be able to use this uh, instrument uh, with, with the expected high radio velocity precision. So this was my overview of uh, EPRV instrumentation. Uh, I want to thank everybody. I want to thank the organizers for uh, inviting me to give this presentation. And I also want to say a thank you to uh, 
Paul Robertson at UC Irvine, to Andreas Grierenbach in Heidelberg, to Francesco Pepe in Geneva, and to Suvav Mahadevan at Penn State, who all provided slides for this uh, uh, presentation. Thank you.